Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast is your one-stop shop for fantasy football news and advice. Can't decide on who to draft on the first round? Going gaga on how to line up your team. Got you covered. Traditional leagues, dynasty leagues, PPR leagues, IDP leagues, IDP leagues, even daily fantasy football leagues. Join us as we break down all the questions of fantasy football. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast on the GSMC Podcast Network. What's up? How's everybody doing? I hope everyone's having a good, nice, find end to their week, into the weekend. And what a better way to start your weekend shenanigans than coming here and listening to the GSMC to get all your fantasy football news, updates, topics of discussion, all the juice. The ins and outs. You're coming right here to the right place. Of course, it's Ethan here again for the GSMC. And we got a lot of things to go over today. Some of the various topics we'll be discussing. We're going to do a little mini deep dive on half of the NFC North Division. So we're going to be talking about Green Bay and Minnesota for their fantasy potential. Offensively, of course. And... Of course, we're going to be doing, you know, some usual topics of discussion. We're going to be dapping into the, the quarterbacks, tapping into them. And we're going to also be looking at some wide receivers potentially on the rise of having a really, really good breakout year that we've been kind of pre- pre- actively looking forward to, but not too sure if we were ever going to get. So we might see some great things coming out of some young men real, real soon. But first... We got to go ahead and talk about the first topic of the day, which is bust. What is a bust? How do we look at bust? And how do we feel about the idea of a player that busts? Now, of course, busting in sports culture means a lot of different things, right? So let's take it. Let's take it here. In. Regular NFL terms, a bust means you put a lot of draft capital. You put your your biggest chip on the table, your first round pick, and you drafted a guy who at that position, as in the draft position, at that draft position, he was supposed to be a game changer for you. He was going to be somebody that, for lack of a better term, provide a spark for your team, be that defensively or offensively, depending on the position. And the player did not live up to the hype. And living up to the hype can mean anything from not doubling down, not getting a Super Bowl to, you know, not being able to stay consistently on the field. And it could be like, you can be a a bust or a disappointment in many other ways. So injuries can be a factor and that could make you a bust. Or the situation that you were in might have made you a bust at an earlier time in your career, but now you're more of a serviceable player in the locker room. You may not be the the star player or the front runner or whatever the case may be, but you are somebody who has earned the respect of the NFL fan and maybe even the general populace that, you know, your career may not be what it should have been or maybe your career didn't end up the way you thought it would, but you're still around and you're still relevant to a certain extent and, you know, we all we all respect you for who you are now. So, for example, like RG3 would be considered a bust in many people's eyes because of the injuries, but he's still around, he's still a backup, and I'm sure he still would love to start one day somewhere else. But for now, he is in a in the primary backup role. He's kind of in a 
a role that is looked at more mentorship rather than something that you can look at and say, okay, he's trying his hardest to get into the starting job. And I'm sure he is, but we see this with guys like him, Tyrod Taylor, of course, uh, Fitzpatrick. These are guys who are perennial backups for now that can start at times. And, but the problem is those starts are probably because you're trying to wait out to get another quarterback who's young in the draft to, you know, boost your franchise. You're not making Ryan Fitzpatrick your, your franchise guy. You're not making RG3 your franchise guy. You're not making Tyrod Taylor your franchise guy. But he's a placeholder, and you know what you're getting with those players, and that matters. That's why quarterbacks still make a lot of money, even on the low end, because it's a very hard position to play, and you need guys who you've seen that can at least get the job done and can you know, steer the ship for a little while before... You know, you get some, a young buck in there. So that could be a bust. Or a bust could just be a guy who comes in super high in the draft and everybody's like, oh, his potential is through the roof or um, anything like that, and they just don't live up to the potential. And that could be, to some people's eyes, that can be really, really small, minuscule thing. So for me, I feel like Cam Newton wasn't a bust and he lived up to the hype. But for some people think... Cam Newton did not deliver the the level of on the level of hype that he came in out of college. Um, same thing with you know James Winston. Some people say James Winston is a bust. I don't believe James Winston is a bust. You can look at Marcus Mariota. That's probably a better way of judging who is a bust or not. Primarily because his career really just not has not gone anywhere. And he's already been replaced by a guy who was drafted way lower than he was. So what does that really mean for fantasy? Because I think we all kind of understand what busts are at the end of the day from a sport, real sport, real life sport perspective. Bust in IRL. We, we've been there before. We know what busts look like at that uh you know, at that level. So, with that said, let's say we look at it from fantasy. What is a bust in fantasy? So, you know, you got to be able to craft a winning strategy and you got to be able to make sure you can sift through all the players that have no value to you and you got to be really critical of the players that you have holding high value of. So, you don't want to get somebody who can derail your season. Like, for example, when I drafted last year, I was getting very much derailed by the lack of Odell, you know, touchdowns in the standard league that I had. I had Julio and Odell. Both were not scoring touchdowns at a rate that I needed them to, and thus I was being let down. It was tough. And I also had Philip Lindsay on the same team. Philip Lindsay was a draft bust across the board comparative to his other contemporaries that were picked around him or around the same, you know, draft position. So that was a bust and it hurt me real bad at the end of the day. And it really, really hurt my chances of making the playoffs that year. So it could be, you know, injuries, decreased effectiveness in a new system, declining skills or any other form of regression and it's inevitable that players, like, you know, will find itself to lower down. So disappointment is always going to come, no matter where to, no matter where you look at it. Somebody's going to get somebody who is not going to execute or not going to be as good as they thought they were going to be. Not everybody can be the breadwinner. But there is a model out that is looking at who potentially could be a bust. So, like, past bust like Derek Carr in 2017 and Allen Robinson in 2018. Uh, the same model is uh, powered by the same people who generated projections for all three major fantasy sites. And it beat human experts last year 
and when there is a big difference in ranking and the projections update multiple times a day so you can always check it out this is from sports line and it simulated the entire nfl season ten thousand times and released a light released this latest rankings alongside it so here are some of the top busts so they are definitely not fans of greg olsen on seahawks so one of the top tight end options in the league from 2012 to 2016 and injuries have definitely hurt his career and slowed it down and he's just appeared in 30 games over the past three seasons so he posted a respectable 52 catches 597 yards receiving and two touchdowns last year and some fantasy players are hoping for a revival as he joins you know russell wilson and the seahawks but Olsen is been around getting picked around the 14th round, according to most uh, ADP in fantasy football. But people are even saying it's a reach, or the model is saying it's a reach there too. And there are seven other tight ends that are going off the board later than him who have projected to produce more. And those type of players are even Ian Thomas, Christian Herdon, and Jay Sternberger. So don't just look at the numbers uh, and just have the name of Olsen and think you're going to get somebody that can really get the job done. Next, uh, another bust that they're talking about is Le'Veon Bell, which is really a probably one that's a little bit more controversial because you think that Le'Veon would have a better season than he did last year and one more year in the system. But, of course, after missing all 2018 for sitting out uh, because of the franchise tag from Pittsburgh, Bell scored a lucrative deal with the Jets and made him a top 10 pick as he was returning in 2019, but he looked nothing like the Bell of old, and he was just 3.2 yards per carry. And even though he put up 1,250 yards from scrimmage and scoring only four total touchdowns. So entering the season, he's still going to be at the tail end of the second round. And even then, uh, we don't know. He's going to be more comfortable in the offense, and he's ranked but he's ranked 101st in fantasy points per touch last season, and that's why the model has him behind third-round options like Chris Carson, Todd Gurley even, and uh, guys like Melvin Gordon. But what can you really say more about that, in my opinion? I feel like looking at it from that perspective, let's stay on the Le'Veon thing real quick. So Le'Veon is in an offense that really had a struggle finding itself midseason because of, you know, the mono, the, <laughs> the the mono. Like, your quarterback went down with mono. How can, how can anybody look at that offense and say, I have a definitive idea of what it's going to look like this year because Sam Darnold went down in the middle of the season and they didn't really have a backup running back to take a lot of the load off of Le'Veon Bell, and now that's what they've invested in. So let's keep in mind, they picked up Frank Gore in the offseason. He's still trucking around. He's still running the football. He's still here. Frank Gore is on the Jets. So he's been on every AFC, or I'm sorry, every every AFC East team, except for the Patriots, Frank Gore has touched the rock for. So just putting that in perspective, he just keeps on trucking keeps on trucking but he's there and you know the Jets are a team that are probably going to rely on the run game because it helps young quarterbacks get acquainted in the system I don't think they're going to unleash Sam Darnold just yet because I just don't see that happening but to sit here and think that Le'Veon is going to be a bust that's kind of tough now it's not looking good it didn't look good last year and if it was me and I drafted him last year, I'm probably not going to draft him again. But that's not out of the ordinary for any other people. Like, I don't plan on drafting Odell this year. I got to see it before I do that again. I got to see what he's capable of. I got to see what the Cleveland offense is capable of. And you're going to be talking about that a little bit later in the podcast. But we need to be able to know what we're getting into. We're investing our picks into players, and we want to know. We want to have maximum amount of faith that we can have that they aren't going to be a bust so that's why people are kind of like "Ooh, let me pass on Le'Veon Ooh, 
Melvin Gordon doesn't look like he's going to get any better. than He's not going to return to where he was before. Let me pass on that. Ooh, Phil Lindsay and Melvin Gordon are out there. Let me pass on that. Like, it's going to be a little difficult. It's going to be hard. And I'm not sure when, you know, when you're doing your drafts, how to always go about it. You're going to have to do a lot of extensive research on different team concepts and or team schemes, read up on what they're doing or who's participating in these, you know, unofficial OTAs. Like, you're going to have to start getting nitty gritty because it's about that time where you start to hear about the rookies or the second year guys who have miraculously changed their body type or did this, that, and the third to make themselves more competitive. And that's just uh, that's just the name of the game, baby. That's fantasy. But we're going to take our first break. And coming back, we are going to talk about the NFC North, half and half. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right, so we got to be talking about a lot of things coming soon about the NFL season because this is a fantasy football podcast and we have to make sure we stay up to date. And right now, the biggest thing that I've heard out of the NFC North side of the NFC divisions is about a good old Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook is essentially saying that he is not going to come to practice when practice is necessary or practice is able for people to come back. You know, people can come and do things, uh, organize football play because he wants a new deal and he is not going to play and have a holdout until the deal gets done. And this is the classic running back thing to do. And I'm not doubt, I'm not dogging, you know, Dalvin Cook for doing this because I'm all for you know, running backs getting their money because you never know when things can go wrong. And honestly, it's worked out more for them than it has not worked out for them at this point in running back holdout history. They have more like a 60% success ratio rather than, uh, rather than what you would normally think. And that's because sometimes their careers may end up not being what it need, what it used to be before the contract. But it's not about their career statistics or anything for, like, if they won the contract deal, right? It's more so for their security of getting guaranteed money. Like, people think that Le'Veon lost the deal. Like, Le'Veon lost in the whole holdout. He didn't lose. He got more guaranteed money, and he took a year off on his body wear and tear. And, sure, he didn't have the best year last year, but really, who had a good year offensively on the Jets? It's the freaking New York Jets. Like, come on, let's let's keep our let's keep our thinking caps on for a second here. We don't know how good really Le'Veon could be next year. Right? Then we were just recently talking about this. We don't know how good he'll be next year. But to sit here and say that, you know, the contract he could have gotten more money maybe on like the back end, but that's not what he was fighting for. And of course, then you'll see, well, but how come Christian McCaffrey gets this much money, this, that, and the third? Well, that's just because the Panthers recognize that Christian McCaffrey was their sole offensive weapon last year. Now, I'm not saying that to disrespect DJ Moore or anybody else on an offense, but Christian McCaffrey was what made that offense run. That was it. 
not the quarter the quarterback situation was already a mess so they just said christian take the ball christian come tote this rock for me christian come catch this pass out of the backfield christian go out in the slot and go run some routes christian what do you think about this play christian come write up a play for us you could have but you could have told me christian mccaffrey was out there coaching on the field with the, what he was doing out there because he was unbelievable. If this was basketball and we were looking at usage rates, Christian McCaffrey was Russell Westbrook 2017 or something like that or 2016, whatever year it was when he won MVP. Usage rates was through the roof. It was crazy. He was on a sole MVP run before they basically bottomed out to get into better draft position. He was insane. All that being said, he didn't have to hold out because they already knew what was up. <laughs> so Dalvin Cook holding out is no surprise. We saw Zeke hold out and he got paid. And sure, he didn't, he gave us a scare in the fantasy scene, but he turned it around. You know, he's still giving us scares. You know, he got coronavirus and that's nothing to laugh at or anything like that. And it's nothing to really be mad at him actively per se. Anybody could just walk around these days. Anybody could go to the store. And you could be exposed to coronavirus. Like, that's not, you can't prevent it any more than the average person unless, you know, you are actively trying to, you know, live normal life again. But all that being said, it's not, you know, this isn't a dog on Ezekiel Elliott. But it does seem like Ezekiel Elliott always finds himself involved in some offseason piece that, you know, Cowboys fans just don't want to deal with every single time. But, that is the present. That's the thing that matters the most right now in the NFC North side is what is going to happen with Dalvin Cook? Is he going to get the new deal? What's going to happen with that? Are the owners feeling it? We'll see. But let's pretend that he will be there. He'll be paid and he'll play week one, game one. We're going into Minnesota. Here we go. So first off, Let's look at what football outsiders have to say about their offensive DVOA. So if we know anything about DVOA, uh, defensive adjusted value over the average uh, for the total offense for the whole season. So that's uh, as well as rushing and passing offense separated. And uh, all the numbers are basically adjusted on to average schedule opponents and the average percentage of Fumbles recovered by the offense, so the exceptions are like, you know, five columns, so non-adjusted stuff. But Minnesota was ranked 10th last year in offense altogether, and their weighted offense was 13th. So they were in the top half of the league in offensive, you know, efficiency and really did some great things. They were ranked um, in rushing offense. They were ranked 16th, which was interesting to me. But passing offense, they're ranked 10th. And it's probably because, you know, Kirk Cousins isn't a guy who likes to throw turnovers. He's not a turnover guy. It's not something that he, it's definitely something that he prides himself of not doing. And it helps that he has someone like Dalvin Cook that although has issues staying healthy throughout most of his career so far, when he is on the field, he is the scariest guy on the field by far and he makes that offense run and it goes really by what he does so looking at Dalvin Cook last year he was ranked in rushing on DVOA so or I'm sorry from Football Outsiders he was the basically the eighth best running back as far as uh above his replacement he had 800 or 183 yards um, per replacement. So that means the person above him or under him, he got that many more yardage after the fact, averagely. And, you know, his yards above replacement, um, his rank last year was about five. So, you know, the DVOA... It's about 9%, which ranks 10th. So the rankings are kind of weird in all all different types of ways. Um, When you look at it from a larger standpoint, 
But I like to look at things called, you know, effective yards and success rate to to see exactly how good a running back actually is sometimes. And his effective yardage is really good. So he's 13th in effective yardage, but his success rate is 49%. And thinking of coming from a guy like a backfield where he doesn't share the rock a lot, uh, that means a lot, in my opinion. He only fumbled three times. Like, to look at the guy who was the rushing champ, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> his his effective yardage um, isn't ranked 13th, by the way. It's just, he had 13 touchdowns. But um, his success, let's look at Ty, um, um, Derek, <laughs> let's look at Derrick Henry. I'm getting tug tied here. Let's look at Derrick Henry. His effective yards, he only had about 200 something more yards over the fact of effective yardage. And he had a 50% success rate. And that has him ranked 17. So it was only a 1% difference in effective yardage and is a different change of rank. So if he, he's up there in the upper echelon of running backs. This is the guy who won the rushing champ. And we got to remember that Dalvin Cook is in a spectacular pass catcher out the backfield type as much as someone like uh, Aaron Jones or... Christian McCaffrey or even Ezekiel Elliott we see him more as a downhill runner he's able to run inside outside make guys miss he's a really 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 strong runner uh and pure runner so he's closer to Derrick Henry than he is to a Christian McCaffrey but that doesn't hurt him as much now a lot of this stuff does look at the efficiency overall and how the offenses are played so we'll see guys like Kenyon Drake uh, above, you know, a Derrick Henry or a Mostert above a Dalvin Cook. And we're not saying that they are better overall players than these guys. They just offer a a, a wider skill set that is also more valuable to their team concept. But looking at all of that in, let's remind ourselves of some receivers because that's just Dalvin Cook and I know Dalvin Cook is a large portion of their offensive game. So we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't sleep on that. But let's keep in mind what else is possible here. So, man, they have a lot of good receivers. <laughs> they had Stephon Diggs last year, of course. He's not there anymore. And they still had another breadwinner up there. Now, he didn't have as good of a year as you would have liked to see, in my opinion. I think that when you think about where their offense was and where what makes it tick, it was definitely their run game, but what comes after the run game is play action. But what we're looking at here is a Adam Thielen, who essentially was the 40th best-ranked receiver off of yards above replacement. And... That's not to say that he's, you know, he's bad or anything like that. He got 16 touchdowns or six touchdowns last year and he didn't fumble at all. So that's good. Or, and, um, he got his effective yardage was 451 while, you know, his total yards, um, he caught 48 passes last year. So he, he tried his best <laughs> to say the least. He, it was a weird year for their, for the passing offense because at the early parts of the, of the year, we didn't see them really throw the ball in, in decision make. Like there wasn't a lot of decision making of going downfield. It was more like dink and dunk kind of play it safe. And that's Kirk Cousins calling card for the better half of his career is that he plays it safe. He kind of dinks and dunks, and he doesn't like to throw turnovers. But that also means we got to remember now that we're looking at the past here. So this is not what will look like in the future. We don't know that yet. But Stephon Diggs was the 10th best ranked receiver, and he had about 1,000 yards. And he had 1,000 effective yards and six touchdowns himself. And he just looked like a guy who 
was coming into his own of being the guy. And they traded the guy away, <laughs> essentially. And they ended up getting Justin Jefferson. So they went younger. They don't have to pay all that money. And they got a guy who they believe probably could replace Stephon Diggs' production. And I think Justin Jefferson coming off of the title season and just the story, he just looks like a guy who can really get it done. And I think they like blue chippers. They don't like drama in Minnesota. You know, Mike Zimmer is a guy who's not he's not a drama guy. He doesn't do the drama thing. Uh, he's never really has. And that's just kind of what he is, is all business. That's why this Dalvin Cook thing is kind of interesting because if Dalvin Cook really makes this a big deal, it's very possible that they just say, you know what? Fine, Dalvin, go somewhere else. We don't, we don't really need you here. Like that just, that wouldn't surprise me one bit coming out of Minnesota who has shown that they can make do without. And or they can believe they can make do without. We should also probably talk about, you know, Kyle Rudolph, who honestly is I don't really know what to say fantasy wise. Kyle Rudolph is a guy who in fantasy has kind of had diminishing returns over the years. And he had a nice little playoff run at the end. But in all actuality, I wouldn't really go looking for Kyle Rudolph. It was me. And I'm sure there's better players that that certain position that you can find in your draft at an earlier portion or even at that moment that would provide better upside value than a Kyle Rudolph does. And that's mainly because the offense is still really heavy, heavily, you know, leaning on the run game. And that's just kind of where they are at the time. But we're going to take a break and coming out, we're going to be talking about Green Bay. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G smcpodcast.com for more info. Okay, GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast, and we just finished talking about the Minneapolis Vikings. I'm sorry, <laughs> Minneapolis. The Minnesota Vikings, right? Now, Minnesota is a place where you kind of understand what their identity is. They're going to play hard-nosed defense. They're going to get after the quarterback. They're going to run the ball with Dalvin Cook, and they're going to try and get into the play-action game and really try and throw a couple deep balls. It may get to Adam Thielen. It may end up now going to Justin Jefferson. As you, as we all know, that Stephon Diggs is no longer there. He was traded to the Bills for a first-round pick. And I think the Bills are pretty satisfied with what they are receiving, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm excited to see what they are capable of really next year at all. And... Now we have to talk about Green Bay because Green Bay also had some interesting, you know, off season news and things like that. You know, they let go of Jimmy Graham, they let him walk, and we all know about the the draft, what happened in the draft, and how everybody was really, really critical of Green Bay for what happened in the draft. And I was also critical of them for what they did in drafting Jordan Love, and it was really kind of weird how it all transpired. And it was very poetic that the same thing happened to Brett Favre. And now the same thing is happening to Aaron Rodgers. And Aaron Rodgers seems to be a lot more accepting of this, as I would hope so, considering he was in a similar position. And he was treated really, really poorly by Brett Favre. And unfairly as well. And I think he understands that he doesn't have to do it that way, for one. And two, it... um. 
it's just a, the way of the, it's the cycle. It's just how it works. Now, it is a bit weird that Green Bay basically said that they weren't looking like in that draft, they didn't get really any outside help. And by outside help, I mean wide receivers on the outside. And Green Bay, even though looking at their offensive efficiency ratings from last year, Green Bay is ranked eighth in 2019. And last year they were ranked seventh. So they really only went down one, one spot there. But, you know, weighted, they were, uh, ranked ninth. But their pass offense, their 11th in pass offense, and they were number one or number four in rush offense. So it's really, really telling to me that Green Bay is in a different, it was a different place. It's in a different place and different function than it was under Mark, under Mike McCarthy, right? So when we look at what the Mike McCarthy Packers were, it was literally, Just Aaron Rodgers throwing the ball like 40 times. Right receivers are kind of bare. Like after the Donald Driver, after the Greg Jennings, they kind of dissipated and left the game. They've really been trying to find their next big receiver guy. And of course, they they have Devontae Adams, who is an amazing receiver in his own right. But they don't have anybody else to really help. Geronimo Adelson is not there anymore. They just, they don't have any other names. They keep finding these guys. Granted, these guys are getting opportunities to make a name for themselves. But they don't have anybody that, you know, can be a household name that people really know about it outside of the Green Bay fan club. So, now we flash forward. We're in a different sort of offense now that predicates on running the football and getting really, 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 really dedicated to a balanced, more balanced attack rather than just throwing the ball up and down the field because they know Aaron Rodgers is not a spring chicken. He's not young. He's getting older. He's not as old as Tom Brady or Drew Brees, but he's getting older. And they're trying to preserve him as much as they can uh, and as efficiently as possible, as efficient as possible. Like we saw this with Drew Brees too a few years ago when Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara were just running the ball sharing the rock they were just doing they were literally doing amazing things with the football and drew Brees was kind of taking a back seat he wasn't launching as much as he because he didn't need to for one their offensive attack was really really successful and two i don't think he really had the tell he couldn't do it he still can't his arm strength is gone drew Brees' arm strength is gone of course aaron Rodgers still kind of has it but it's going to leave him too everybody has that moment where they realize i can't do the same things that I used to be able to do, and I have to adjust in order to be successful. And Aaron Rodgers, although he and his um he and his head coach do butt heads quite a bit sometimes on the sideline last year, he has to adjust, and that's just where the they are right now. They're adjusting to a different style. So not to say like eleventh in pass offense is pretty good. That's pretty good. You're in the top half of the league in passing offense before. You're in the elite rushing conversation right there. Elite rushing. So let's look at their running backs. Um, Aaron Jones was the fourth best running back, according to Football Outsiders, uh, and his uh, you know yards per average ran. He was ranked third, and his yards over above replacement was ranked third. I'm sorry, his yards <laughs> above replacement was ranked fourth across the board. And his DVOA was 7th. So that's really, really good. He had 236 runs, 1,091 yards rushing. He had 1,200 effective yardage, 16 touchdowns, only fumbled twice, and had a 60, I'm sorry, he had a 56% um, success rate. And that's 5th in entire running backs really good (laughs) really really good like insane really good and there's only a few people above him like that right there's only so many above so that's mark ingram latavius murray chris carson ezekiel elliott 
uh, are above them in success rate, right? But let's look at effective yardage, right? Now, effective yardage, he is fifth, but there's got Christian McCaffrey, Leakyu Elliott, Derek Henry, Nick Chubb, Chris Carson, and Chris Carson didn't even play the full season. So let's just say Aaron Jones was really, really good last year, right? And I can only expect him to be better or the same. I don't really expect a lot to change within that offense because a lot really hasn't changed with their running backs. You know, they still have um, Jamal Williams. They still have, you know, they do what they do with their different backs. We all know who who does what in which system. Jamal Williams is more of the cast catcher. Aaron Aaron Jones is uh, more of a running back aficionado. So, so he can catch out the backfield, but he is not his 100% strongest suit so to speak and they try to stick to their strengths out there as much as possible and I understand why that is so looking towards the future let's look at Green Bay's offensive potential now on the passing side of things of course you know they were ranked 10th like we just said and we got to look at it from from a real perspective. Let's, let's, let's be real here, Green Bay. You know, Devontae Adams in, you know, his DVOA and all this stuff, his his actual raw stats don't help the case of how important he is on the offense. He is their playmaker. He is their guy that can do it all, right? But his yards above the average is not as high as I would like to see it as, but... Maybe that's just because they don't do a great job distributing the ball as much as you'd like to see. He's ranked 31st as far as his, um, you know, his yards above replacement. And, you know, his DVOA is ranked 43rd. So he does get a pretty solid volume. Like he received 127 passes. He didn't get a thousand yards but he did get a thousand yards in effective yardage he had five touchdowns and his catch rate was a 65 so that's pretty good granted then you look at guys like michael thomas who had a 538 yards above replacement that's pretty that's pretty insane right (laughs) That's pretty insane, and he had a really, really solid volume. He had almost 2,000 effective yardage, and he had an 81% catch rate, and he had nine TDs. He He's a stud. We all know Michael Thomas is a stud, so we don't have to talk about that. But Green Bay, you know, Lazard is only a few spots below Devontae Adams. You know, and the next person on Green Bay to pop up on this on this ranking is Vantes Scatling, who's seventy first. That isn't a good sign for Green Bay's passing attack, and I think they already know this. They already know this, right? There's no we we can't keep giving excuses to to GMs and to these people who try to bring teams together. There's just no way you can come out of this offseason and look at where your receivers are and be like, yeah, we're still good. We like what we got here. Like, I just don't see what they see. I don't see it. So here are some quick recommendations here, in my opinion, for both of these teams. We'll do both because I didn't do it for Minnesota. We're going to do it for Minnesota and Green Bay. Let's keep on Green Bay first, though. Green Bay. If you're going to draft Green Bay players, let's say high tier, mid tier, low tier. Low tier, maybe Scatling if you need, if you're really in a deeper league and you need somebody who is probably going to be their number two guy in the passing game for now. We don't know exactly how it's going to turn out, but that just seems to be what is the case. Mid tier. We're going to get our, you know, Jamal Williams, our, um, you know, 
that's generally what we're going to get. Jamal Williams is more mid-tier. And Aaron Rodgers, to a certain extent. Uh, I put him in that because quarterbacks, typically, you can find a solid quarterback or even better one before you have to go reach for Aaron Rodgers. I mean, there were times where people would draft Aaron Rodgers as the first quarterback off the board, but those days are done. You know, he is a more of a value quarterback now. And he's he could light it up. He still has the potential, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. And if you're looking for a guy to light it up, he's not the one. So he's kind of more mid-tier for, you know, sought-after ability in the in the Green Bay offense. And then you have two high tiers, Aaron Jones and you have Devontae Adams. Now, these two guys are the breadwinners of the offense. For the past few years, they have been. Aaron Jones has been really, really good for the past few years. And Devontae Adams is a guy who I've always been really high on. I think he's one of the better receivers in the league. He's definitely top 10, borderline top 5, and he doesn't get all the respect that he deserves. Partially because a lot of, like, as much as Green Bay is a historic NFL franchise, I don't feel like they do big numbers TV-wise. I don't think people care about Green Bay as much as they did early in the early 2000s or or the 2010s because you know Favre was there and then when A-Rod was there the Favre was still kind of there and you know of course when A-Rod was hot he was young and he had and I mean hot (laughs) I mean hot as in like playing hot but uh he won the Super Bowl and then Things kind of kind of tailed off in the Mike McCarthy era. Things kind of got weird. Aaron Rodgers got hurt a few times, and things just weren't the same. Now, of course, they're really, really popular still as an NFL franchise. It doesn't just go. It it doesn't just you know stop there, but it finds it does find itself being a little bit less more relevant than other teams in recent time, and that's just kind of how the story goes, right? Like I would admit, I would say the Titans are a lot more relevant now that people are caring about them, but that doesn't make them a mainstream team. The Patriots are a mainstream team, right? We all know about the Patriots. We're gonna watch the Patriots. The Cowboys are a mainstream team, no matter how dysfunctional they can be. They're mainstream. People are gonna watch what they have to offer. The Steelers, in my opinion, are a mainstream team. They're gonna watch. Kansas City is a barn burner mainstream team. People are gonna watch them. So that is those who are in. and then quickly uh mid tier, high tier, low tier. Low tier, Kyle Rudolph, don't really want to touch a mid tier. Justin Jefferson for now. He may creep up later on. But Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen are probably mid tiers to have potential to go up. And then high tier is Dalvin Cook. And that's where that's where that is. But we're going to take Another break, and then we're going to come back and talk about some more disappointment. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Okay, so we're coming back at it, and I brought a guest with me, fellow podcast mate fellow co-host of the gsmc football podcast is my good friend bryce lewis bryce thank you for coming out man i appreciate you coming on to the fantasy realm of things you know i know you play fantasy football and we're still trying to figure out if we're going to have a gsmc football league you know keep it fun for everybody else involved but have you been keeping up with some fantasy news of recent have you been looking into into your rankings or anything like that? Oh, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I've been looking into it, man. And by the way, I want to say appreciate you for having me on. But, you know, 
I, I look into it because, you know, I, obviously I, I made my own league last year and I won, you know. <laughs> so uh, obviously, you know, getting those emails talking about we're gearing up for the next season. I'm just like, all right, let me check these rankings and see what's going on. A lot of these people are the same from last year, obviously. Obviously, a couple people were changing locations, obviously brought their value up and down. So, you know, I, I keep an eye on those things because, you know, I'm ready to defend my championship. So, you know, I'm gearing <laughs> up. <laughs> Bryce, the winner among the people. All right, Bryce. Mm-hmm. So I brought you on to talk about disappointment as I don't mean as in, you know, your disappointment to your family or anything like that. <laughs> not that type of disappointment, which <laughs> I hope you're not. I don't think you are. I think you're a very successful young man. But as in who is gearing up to disappoint us this fantasy season? We always look at who potentially could be a bust or who could be a rising superstar. But we definitely never really look at who potentially just could disappoint us. The guys who you expect so much of, but really just middle of the pack. And it just doesn't do doesn't do it justice. So it's kind of like a bust, but it hurts a little bit more. Because it's not really a bust when they're that good. It's kind of like they just didn't live up to their potential. Yeah, I, I definitely get what you're saying. Uh, in my mind, eh, there could be a couple of... Uh players that might be in that disappointment realm. So I'll, I mean, I, I definitely can maybe think of a few that might disappoint us potentially if you draft them this season, just based off matchups and et cetera. So uh, you want, you want to drop right into it, Ethan? You want me to start giving them out? No, nah, I can, I can, I got some on my list currently that I can, I'm just going to ask you just how do you feel about the, the disappointment potential between these couple teams or just their offenses or certain players, and we'll go back and forth on that. So okay. the first thing I wrote, I feel like you can predict this, is Cleveland. I just wrote the word Cleveland, the name of the city, as more likely to disappoint us. <laughs> because here we are again. We look at Cleveland's offensive potential on this roster. You know, they brought in a one of the better catching tight ends in the league via trade from the Falcons. They still have David and Joku. They have Nick Chubb. They have Odell. They have, you know, Jarvis Landry. And we should expect that uh oh, they also still have Kareem Hunt. And <laughs> maybe we should be expecting that Baker Mayfield should be more successful in this play action oriented offense that seems to be what they're going to be going for right Mm -hmm. but why do i feel in the back of my mind stay away from the cleveland (laughs) stay away from cleveland (laughs) oh listen i feel like okay you you obviously focus offensively obviously you make cleveland something in the whole team but Offensively, I can I can understand why you feel that way. I can understand why you're not 100 percent sure about any player. If you draft any player off that offense, I mean, with the way Cleveland has been, you don't know what you're going to get. Well, I, I mean, don't know the Dar- only player you would that you have no choice but to draft is Nick Chubb because you know he is going to get his. But everybody else, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, that is true. I it's. It could be one of those things. If they had a good season, it could be one of those things. Oh, they have too many players, so you just got to make sure you draft the right one. Obviously, like you said, Chubb is going to get his. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't draft Baker unless I was just. I honestly, I, I wouldn't even. It would have to be the last pick, and I need another quarterback, and there's no one else left. Because I, I just don't know, and you don't know. And obviously, if Baker doesn't do well, Odell and Jarvis won't get numbers. So then it's like very risky to draft them, and then you know Hooper and Joku. It could be one of those situations like Philadelphia, even though Philadelphia was in a good situation last year because they didn't have no receivers. You know, obviously the Eagles tied in with the best fantasy players and best receivers in general. You know, could be one of those situations. Would it be better for you to draft an Njoku or a Hooper? It's just a lot of questions there. Honestly, I feel more confident in the defense of Cleveland if I was just drafting Cleveland's defense. But offensively, in terms of players, I'm just not – it, unless it's Chubb, like you, I, I just, I don't know if there's a good pick. Like I, I mean, you can draft him, 
but I wouldn't say, yeah, you're going to be like one of my top picks and I need you to be the top player, one of my top players. Like I would have to see a few weeks and then hopefully they're on the waiver wire still and I pick them up. <laughs> mm. All right. Let's keep going here. I have a few more. Philip Rivers. Is he going to disappoint us? Now, Indianapolis really, really tooled up their offense in the offseason via draft and a little bit in free agency. As you know, they still have Jake Doyle, which is cool. And we're going to have to expect a lot out of him in the tight end spot. But they went and got... um they got another running back in Jonathan Taylor via the draft. They went and got Michael Pittman through the draft as a wide receiver. And they already still have Marlon Mack and uh, Naheem Himes. We're just, they look like they're, and they still have T.Y. Hilton. They have probably a top five offensive line. And I say probably because I think they're probably top three. And, you know, it's all depend. It's all there. It's all there. <laughs> it's all there. All Philip mm-hmm. has to do is throw it. Can he okay. throw the football to the correct team, Bryce? Well, I got to have a question. So what would you – okay, obviously we have projections and everything. But what's a good number that you – if you draft a quarterback, you would want that quarterback to hit every week. What would be a good number for you? You mean what round? If you do standard rules in the like no like like you know like I if you drafted like you've drafted a quarterback like what number would you be like I need my quarterback to at least give me this amount of points per week? From my quarterback, I need a solid twenty points for me. Twenty, okay. So think about that. Now, On do you average. think Phil Rivers could consistently give you twenty points? That's the question. Because well, he might get you close. Because Phil can throw for some yards. I mean, but it's just some turnovers. He's been a twenty-four <laughs> point per game kind of guy. Or close to it from a quarterback standpoint. Uh, he yeah, can but get you know, there. It, it, it kind of reminds me. I'm not, I mean, obviously, he's not at the level of Jameis. But, you know, Jameis can do the same thing. But it's just, you know, turnovers, we're breaking it down. If, 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 you feel, if, if you feel confident in it, then I would say no. He wouldn't be disappointed. But if you're not confident in it, I would say yes. I'm kind of on the, on, on, the, on the ledge about it. I, I think he could give you that. But it really just depends on how they build the team, too. It, it really does. Phillip is a guy who, if he plays like he played last season, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't even touch it. But if, if he can play better, because he has the perfect situation. But if he can't play better, I, I wouldn't even touch Phillip Rivers. I think he'd be a disappointment. I'm just concerned because it's not like he left from, you know, he went from absolutely nothing to – to this he had what he had in you know on the chargers and the chargers have quite a bit to work with so i don't know uh real quickly last one before we wrap it up uh i'm really really starting to become a little bit skeptical of tennessee and what they are capable of offensively for a full season we know the run was really nice and we know derrick henry is the truth but can we really trust Tannehill for a full season to get the job done and really to throw the football. Can we trust Tannehill to get the ball out? I mean, based off his history, obviously Tannehill's never been great, but I've never looked at Tannehill and said he was bad either. He was kind of like, he kind of reminds me of like a, a, like the, I guess the best version that we've ever seen of Andy Dalton almost in a way, <laughs> which isn't bad. It, it's above average. Well, and I think Andy that's Dalton was Andy Dalton's peak was better than. Well, yeah, Tannehill's. of course. When, but you also got to look at the two teams too. And remember when Andy Dalton was dropping, the Bengals were loaded. <laughs> so that's one reason. So you have to bring that into the equation too. Tennessee, I think, in a game manager role, I think it works. Obviously, if you're drafting Tannehill, even though he had a great fantasy run at the end of last year, <laughs> if you're just drafting Tannehill over the course of this season. To be a big like to be a, like a top quarterback, I wouldn't necessarily do that. But I think he, I don't think he'll be that big of a disappointment to me. I, it really just depends, to be honest with you. It depends since Tennessee's not going to be coming off the radar like out of the blue, and now people know. Okay, Tannehill, he's the guy. You know your weapons: AJ Brown, Derrick Henry. All right, Tannehill, we know how to game plan against you. Let's see what you can do. 
then of course you have your you can have your cause for concern. Well, I mean, but, I'm not even really concerned about Tannehill's numbers. I think his numbers will be what it usually is. I'm more of the mindset of concerned about everybody else that has to receive the ball from him. Like, are we going to feel like AJ Brown is like going to take the next step? And if he can, he in that in the offense led by Ryan Tannehill, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I don't want to. I, mean, I don't want to <laughs> put a big time chip you know, big piece in my draft for a guy on the Tennessee that's not named Derrick Henry. It's like, I'm mm-hmm. I'm not sure what is going to happen there. Like, A.J. Brown, you know, Corey Davis, you don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I completely get what you're saying. I mean, hey, if they keep the, the philosophy they had last year in the regular season, which was a bunch of big plays, then I think A.J. Brown would be okay selection. But I understand completely why you have your – hesitations when it comes to the receivers of Tennessee of would it be a good idea right well hesitations uncertainty that's what we do here at the fantasy football podcast on GSMC we're going to wrap things up here Bryce thank you for signing in with us and talking with me for this last segment I'd encourage everybody to please keep it locked here at the GSMC uh thanks for listening Please don't forget to rate, review us, five stars, five stars, and keep it classy out here, man. Uh, It's been the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. We'll talk to you all next week. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program